All right. We are recording. Wait, why is it set like that again? Defaults review to save your users milliseconds. This is a presentation by Marty Sukhoff from Duke, Uni from Duke University, uh, where Marty is, is from the learning management system. He's lead for the learning management system at Duke University, where he started in the fall of 2019. Previously, he worked at San Francisco State University and California State University Northridge as an LMS administrator and support specialist where he participated in the Moodle open source community. Marty will have dedicated breaks built into his presentation for each, each title slide will allow us to interrupt him with any questions that you put into the chat. Uh, so Marty, go on ahead. All right. So I wanna thank everyone for attending. Um, this session is gonna go over some of the changes that we're making here at Duke and also some of the changes we're looking to make in the future in our Sakai instance. Um, you're gonna see a lot of QR codes. I did that kind of out of convenience. Um, so this first QR code will actually lead to the presentation slides. Um, Adam also posted a link directly to it. Um, but in case you're curious, there will be QR uh, codes that you can scan with your phone. All right, so just kind of give a background on who Duke is. We're uh, what's called learning innovation. It's made up of an LMS lead. Um, we also have a support team analyst, and then we have um, some instructional designers. They go under different names in that, but it's kind of two teams that kind of work under that kind of title. Duke has about uh, 6,500 undergraduates and 9,100 grads in professional schools. So it's about 15, 6K total enrollment. Um, what we're going to go over is some of the Sakai tools that we use here at Duke, and then also the templates as well, uh, because these are the two parts of where we would be making these changes. Uh, when we were going to do this, we were originally going to do this when we upgraded to Sakai uh, 20 post spring. Um, but as with a lot of schools, things changed very rapidly come March. Uh, Duke was um, lucky enough, I guess, to have a partner school in Duke Kushan in China. So they actually moved online in January and February. So we kind of got a trial run of this, stop everything, go online very quickly. Um, so now we're gonna be looking to do some of these changes in pre-fall and then later on as well. Um, why we started, or excuse me again, where we decided is again, some of the Sakai tools and the templates, uh, depending on the functionality of each tool, the, where we make these changes is a little bit different. Uh, the why on why we decided to do this was we started to get an outsider's perspective on some of our tools and settings that we have by default, kind of give us a fresh eyes to kind of look at everything. And those fresh eyes happen to be myself, um, coming from a different campus that actually recently kind of done this same thing of where we would, uh, reviewed our default settings and decided to make some changes uh, that if people were making changes all the time, why not set those to the default? Um, how we did this was we started with kind of how I came in looking at it since I was fresh eyed to Sakai. Um, so if there was a certain setting that I wasn't used to or kind of had uh, thoughts about, um, we kind of jotted those down. Um, we also took these to our instructional designers, um, kind of get their background on who they're working with, what they see instructors looking for and what they're changing and then also some database queries that we'll go over here shortly um, that kind of have the hard data in essence. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with databases, we had a MySQL database and a Redshift database. It's read access only provided by our hosting vendor, um, Longsite. Uh, kind of a disclaimer here, uh, this session is titled as a technical deep dive, but I would say this is much closer to kind of sticking a toe in a kiddie pool just to check the temperature, um, because these are very basic uh, SQL queries. Um, before I even started going through and looking these, I actually didn't know any SQL. Um, so I actually went to LinkedIn Learning and YouTube and started learning SQL, so that way I could get some basic queries to pull out and kind of review some of the data. Um, so if I did want to make some changes, I actually have some data to back that up. So if you do see some bad queries, 
um, feel free to call them out. Um, speed and efficiency were not something I was really looking for uh, because I was just kind of pulling a whole bunch of data and joins and would then kind of filter that later on. Um, so again, the QR codes uh, going forward will actually lead to the SQL file, but I'll show them on screen and kind of the results. But in case you wanted to get the uh, SQL codes later, you can. Um, so the first one we went through or that I looked at was the default for um, quizzes in our instance was unlimited attempts. My theory was instructors didn't want to allow that, uh, that in my past decade or so at a couple of universities, one tended to be the or one attempt tended to be what uh, most instructors wanted. If they wanted to allow two or more, they could do that. But on average, most of them were doing one. Um, if they needed to allow a second attempt, they could always do that through the exceptions or any other sort of accommodations. Um, so this is a pretty simple query. Um, it pulls all the quizzes and groups then by the number of submissions. Um, based off this query, when we pulled it, the outcome was that my theory was correct. Um, even with the default set at unlimited, over half, about 53.7% of quizzes had been changed from one attempt to something else. And if over half the people are having to change the default, that should probably not be your default. Um, further reasoning is when I took this data to our instructional designers, they kind of backed that up of anyone they really worked with, it most of the time was allowing one quiz attempt. Um, if there was certain content that they wanted, uh, to allow more attempts, maybe it's something they just wanted the students to learn. Unlimited attempts works fine, but that could be more than that type of item is not used at all in the grading purposes. Um, pedagogically, it may be best to have unlimited attempts, but we also don't want to encourage students to just continue guessing until they get it right. This is where things like question pools can kind of combat that guess forever behavior. Um, but long term, we believe this change will be more in alignment with instructors' desires and that the unlimited attempts uh, percentage will continue to fall down. Uh, the null value there that you see at the top, um, I'm pretty sure these are all quizzes that were set um, or created before the unlimited or before the number of attempts were created. Um, since we have been on Sakai for about nine years, and this is actually pulling from the database of nine years worth of data. So what we've decided to do is we've made the change to our um, quiz uh, quiz tool to default to one attempt going forward. Um, the next one we Marty, have is Marty, there's some discussion on the chat about the unlimited, uh, set, setting it to unlimited as a default. Tiffany says it seems like a really strange default to me. John says, I agree. David says, good point. John, John says again, our default is one. And Laura says, and an unfortunate one if auto submit is enabled. Do you have any comments? Yes. So uh, I'll get to that later, Tiffany. It's actually some of these queries, the results I plan to bring to the community to see if we should change what's in the core code going forward. Um, so if other universities run, run these simple queries, bring back the results, and then we can kind of make a decision if we need to change it for the core code going forward. Um, because unlimited does seem like it's strange to me. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. I, I Don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty sure. Um, so the next query is going to be over the honor pledge. Um, my theory going into this was that most instructors don't even know it's there since it is kind of underneath the drop down menu and thus haven't enabled it. Um, with more courses being expedited to full and online, academic honesty is going to be kind of jumped into the forefront of instructors and administrators' minds. Um, at Duke, we have this disabled. Um, so I wanted to see if people are actually going forth and doing that. Um, so this is the query that we use. So this query is pulling all the quizzes and groups them again, similar to the uh, previous one, um, based off their status. Um, again, we had quite a few bit of nulls, but these were, I believe, again, because these quizzes were created before the honor plate was actually a thing. Um, it was created back in Sakai 11. Um, so I kind of said if it was a zero or one, so if it was a true or false in the database, uh, whether or not that was a valid quiz. And it was actually surprising to see about 26% of quizzes have enabled it. Um, and if you haven't noticed on some of these, I'm looking at the published tables. I'm not looking at the unpublished ones um, where the numbers may be slightly different. And this one, I did do one join to kind of bring some stuff together. Um, but having about a fourth of quizzes changing, it seems to be a pretty significant uh, amount of change. Uh, with more courses moving to fully online or high flex in the fall, Instructors are worried about that academic dishonesty. 
And we also want to kind of promote uh, what we call here at Duke the community standard. It's essentially our local uh, honor code. So what we're going to be looking to do is actually enabling this uh, probably after summer to be ready for fall. And this is just, again, something simple within the uh, uh, assessment type, as I think uh, Tiffany mentioned for the um, number of uh, attempts. Uh, so jumping into chats. There's quite a discussion on chat about defaults and unlimited and um, I could read it if you'd like, or you can scan. Uh, yeah, I'm scanning over it. Um, so yeah, that the honor pledge was one of the things I think actually Duke pushed for um, originally when it was being coded, um, partially because locally uh, they actually put the honor code, I guess, in every single classroom. I haven't been to too many classrooms yet um, because our office is actually off the main campus. Um, but they wanted to kind of make it similar in an online environment so where you could have that honor pledge, the community standard in uh, a quiz atmosphere. Um, and I haven't looked at the studies, but they, I remember looking at the ticket of where this was created and it mentioned that just having the honor pledge before the assessment could help to kind of combat on academic dishonesty uh, because they're reminded of it right before they take a quiz. Any other questions on the honor pledge? All right, going forward. Um, again, another quiz one. Um, this one was a little bit more theoretical. Uh, right now, Duke, we have no time limit set, similar to the submissions allowed, um, thus no restrictions really. Uh, so my theory was that instructors are almost always setting a time limit and potentially if we kind of see a pattern of how long quizzes are, we could set a default limit within the assessment type with the quiz as well, maybe to the most frequent uh, uh, period. Uh, so in this query, uh, we're pulling again all the quizzes uh, and also grouping them by the time limit. Uh, the, there's too many unique results to kind of show because it allows you to set to any minute or hour you want within a day. Um, so I kind of group them into what I would think is the most common one there. Um, we actually have about 18 quizzes that are set to be 23 hours and 59 minutes. Um, I'm not sure why instructors went through doing that. They probably could have just set an uh, open and close time for a day and that kind of would have done it for them. Um, so another reason that I wanted to look at this is setting a correct time limit is kind of often overlooked as a way to prevent cheating. Uh, if you have a quiz that say has 30 multiple choice questions, kind of the, um, what I've heard is people say, oh, just do one minute per multiple choice question. For a lot of students though, if they're they properly studied, one minute is an awful long time to have to review a question. They'll skim the question, the answers, and know right away that's the answer and that's taking them 12 seconds. That means they now have a 48 second barrier to go and look at any other uh, questions that they don't know, kind of research in the book or Google online, which seems like kind of a lot of time to me. Um, so I kind of wanted to get a sense of where the time limit is for a lot of these classes. So from the results, I was actually kind of shocked by the number of quizzes that are still set to no time limit. I believe this is partially due to um, that's the default and either instructors skip over it or they say, okay, that's fine. Um, so we would need to kind of combine this a little bit with um, some other queries to kind of see if a shorter time frame correlates to fewer questions, maybe the question types in the fewer ones because multiple choice true false questions do take a lot shorter to answer than say a short answer or an essay type uh, question. Um, so we could also look at the note, I may limit the query down later on to the no time limit ones to see if they have mostly open-ended questions or if they have long periods um, because there could also be where they've set no time limit in, but the open closed period is only an hour long. So in that essence, it could be where it's really strict of you need to take this quiz during this time period, but you don't really need to set a time limit because you've only got an hour there anyway, and that's how long the instructor wants. So it's less flexible for the student to take it throughout the day, but it does still have that time limit. So with this right now, it's kind of good data for us to look at, um, but we won't be making any changes uh, with that going forward yet. Uh, it would take a little bit more combination of queries. Um, so jumping back to the chat again. There are two comments about the honor pledge and two questions or thoughts about the uh, time limit. So um, Aurelia, we haven't looked at that specifically. Um, 
that would take a good amount of work to do to kind of pull in how long the class is um, to say that, okay, then it's, if you have a 75 minute class, you have a 75 minute quiz. Um, that would be interesting to look at. I'm not sure if we could get all that data from our sys files that we currently get. And then also going forward, um, Duke, and I think a lot of classes are gonna be very flexible around synchronous meeting times. Uh, so there may no longer be a set uh, class time frame of this 175 minutes or an hour long. Uh, it's going to be very much open in the air of a lot of asynchronous work going on. Uh, John says, I know instructors who ask a zero point honor pledge question. Um, Adam talks about the 2359. Um, so these were actually specifically for the um, time limit set. So I was looking at the time limit column within the database. So I'm not quite sure if it would be the auto submit. The auto submit is if it's for a day, potentially it would be something else where it's, I believe that's a different column in the database of this was submitted by the auto submit. Um, so this was actually specifically looking at what the time limit was set within the settings. Uh, all right, so there's a couple more in there, but I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, and to Tiffany, I believe you can make a time limit a default with, in the same place that you can uh, do the honor code and the number of submissions, the default assessment type field. Correct me if I'm wrong. Though. Um, the next tool moving on or away from the quizzes right now, uh, the quizzes are kind of a big one for us just because it's a big assessment piece. Um, was the email role usage. Um, I came from San Francisco State, which was using Moodle, which also has an email tool kind of built in, uh, but we actually had it limited or restricted a little bit more than uh, we had here at Duke. So kind of my theory coming in was that it was mostly used by instructors and that students were more likely to use other informal methods to communicate um, whichever class they or the students preferred. They could use like Facebook Messenger, Instagram, whatever. Um, students tend to kind of go and use whatever least resistance versus coming back to Sakai specifically to email their class kind of seemed like a big barrier. Um, in addition, it, uh, at Duke, the email tool is visible by default and can be used by any roles. Um, that also could potentially introduce some spamming by students if they wanted to. Um, so this uh, query itself was actually done on Redshift. The other ones were previously done on the MySQL database. Um, this query pulled in all the messages sent by the email tool. We then grouped within Excel um, and kind of did a pivot kind of first uh, overall because we didn't want to throw too much filtering into this one originally, but it, the query that the QR code leads to, I think actually has different versions that you can do some filtering with it. Um, it also, that the QR code will also lead to um, a query that includes the term. Um, for this one, we specifically just wanted to look at 2020 just to kind of see some recent data. Uh, but the query in the SQL, SQL file actually does have the term in it. So you could, if you wanted to, you could kind of see some growth uh, over time. Um, so by having it enabled by default, what it also allowed students to do or anyone to do, it would be able to see all other users' email addresses. And potentially they could then take, them, take that email address out, email them outside of Sakai if they really wanted to, or just spam them within Sakai as well. Um, in addition, by having the email tool on by default for students, or excuse me, as a tool in the template by default, um, in our student surveys, uh, a lot of students, when they talked about Sakai, they mentioned specifically certain tools being enabled in a class that the instructors never used. Um, and they didn't like that because they thought they had to consistently go to that tool to see if there was new content there. Um, so what we've decided to do is in our templates, we're hiding the email tool by default. So instructors can continue to use it if they want. If they want their students to use it, they can just make the tool available to them by unhiding it. We thought this was a better approach than leaving the email tool um, available by default, but then changing the permission um, to not allow students to use it. Uh, if a teacher did want to make, some, make the tool available, we thought it'd be much easier for them to unhide the tool than to change the permission. John says he doesn't use 
the email tool at his institution. Is there any specific reason why? Just curious. Um, so as you can see here, the results were that the instructors were using it um, about 15 times more often than the students. Uh, TAs were using it about twice as much as the students. So this kind of um, database uh, results kind of just kind of made our mind up on how we wanted to move forward with this. All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, so this is going to be a big one, I think, going forward for a lot of people is just storage usage and kind of a limit. Um, Duke has probably done as bad as possible job on this. In the past, we still have nine years worth of data on the same database. Um, and we actually don't have a file limit, essentially. So um, according to Longsite, the limit that comes into it is it's 1,000 megabytes per file. Um, so we have a lot of dead data in there from like 2012 that isn't being used, but we're paying long site to store. Uh, my theory coming into this was instructors aren't uploading the files that big, nor should they probably be uploading files that big up into, into Sky as well. Um, so this query pulled all the files. It started grouping them by course. And then uh, it also, if you see in that round sum, I mean, kind of the float with the big number, what that's doing is it's converting it from bytes to gigabytes, uh, since that's a little easier to understand. Um, so this specific query, what it did is it kind of gave us the courses that had the most data in them. Um, so we didn't want to dissuade these users from uploading valuable contents into Sakai, but we also wanted to identify certain areas that may need additional storage or um, something similar like that. Um, with these uh, numbers, what we could do is perhaps we could have an instructor designer also reach out to the instructor to see if they're uploading these large files because there's nowhere else to store them um, or if they just didn't know that they could store them in other places and kind of take them off the Sakai um, database. Um, a lot of the data that you're going to see in the next one was all around um, video files and we do partner with uh, Warpwire and have a box license or they could upload to YouTube if they really wanted to, to kind of move that into a more properly file hosting um, site. Uh, what this uh, query also allows us to do is we could filter it down by term. So Duke does have a retention policy, but again, we haven't done a great job of that. Um, so if we wanted to, we could filter by term and say, okay, in spring, if we were to eliminate spring 2015, we would free up this much storage space. Um, So as much as we like long sites, we don't want to pay extra for storage. And if we're you know, taking up terabytes of storage that we're not using anymore, we kind of want to get that stuff off. So we kind of wanted to know where the terms are, how much can we uh, free up come October when we start actually pruning older courses. Um, and going back to the file limit, uh, long site also mentioned that they, most of their clients have restrictions set to 50 to 250 megabytes. And so we're way over that. So it's something that we're reviewing at an institutional level to kind of set a file size um, cap in the future. Um, but one of the big things that we're going to be working with is our IT department is kind of reviewing their plans for file hosting and vendor um, storage. Um, so say if we were to move from Box to Dropbox or uh, just use uh, MS OneDrive, um, I don't, I'm not privy to those, but those discussions, but it is something that could happen. We don't want to tell all the instructors, hey, go host it there. And then our IT department says, okay, we're not using that vendor anymore. Uh, so David mentions they've been retaining since 2009 as well and just starting. Um, so we're actually going to be doing kind of a rolling period. We, our retention uh, is every five years. Um, but again, we haven't done a great job for that. And so every October, we're going to kind of remove the past year on a rolling cycle. All right, so the next one up is storage type. It's pretty similar. Um, I wanted to do this one out of curiosity though, to kind of see the most frequent file types um, because we have these multiple vendors that can kind of host different files probably better than Sakai can. Um, so I wanted to see what we were looking at. Uh, so again, this one was done in the Redshift database. This query is specifically pulling file types that Warpwire, one of our vendors can support. Um, in theory, this means instructors could host all these file types outside of Sakai and then either link or embed them into their Sakai site. So that's why it's specifically 
like aiming at uh, video or photo or image files. Uh, the number, what's interesting is the number of video files and image files um, that were uploaded in all of 2019 has already been surpassed in the first six months of 2020. So that's actually shocking to see how much more media is being uploaded to our Sakai instance. Um, if you wanted to, you could adjust this uh, query to add a not command. Um, so that way you could pull in like the PDFs and the Word docs to see things that Warfire doesn't support. Um, and then just kind of get a sense of how many of those files are uploading as well. Um, so the results of this, as you can see, is the most common files uploaded are JPEGs and PNGs, um, but they don't take up that much storage. Uh, JPEGs take up about 33 gigs, PNGs about eight gigs. Um, if you look actually at like MP4s, uh, they take, they're only about a fifth of the number of files, but they're taking up over a hundred times as much storage. So these MP4s in theory could be hosted in Warpwire, which is gonna add the benefit of actually streaming the file versus um, sometimes these students are gonna have to download these files. And if you're downloading a gigabyte uh, file and you're on a bad connection, that's gonna be a terrible experience for everybody. Um, so what we're planning to do is I'm gonna work with some of our instructional designers and our communications team to kind of better promote these um, outside vendors to kind of let instructors know, hey, do you have an MP4 file or a video file? Maybe host that in Warpwire and link to it in your Sakai site or embed it. Um, that will be a better experience for the students watching it, but then it's also going to move some of that storage off of um, our Sakai database and into Warpwire as well. Um, and so kind of the key takeaways from this is I'm still a SQL noob. Uh, these are pretty basic queries. Uh, most of them are just joining up a whole bunch of tables and then picking the columns I want to look at. Uh, from when I started it, I kind of did that and then pulled it into Excel and just kind of did the filtering there until I kind of learned how to do that. Um, so I would say if you don't know SQL, uh, even with my current set, uh, skill set, you can kind of go in and learn from LinkedIn um, and it's pretty easy to get going from there. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna propose some of these changes to the community. Uh, if other institutions kind of are getting these same results, maybe we can make some of these changes in core. Uh, I'm going to calendar into um, kind of our team calendar to run these queries about once a year to see if there's been any meaningful changes. Um, perhaps from some of these changes, we also hear complaints as well, and we can always revert back from it. But we, if an instructor has made this change, we can always say it's because 53.7% of instructors or something like that changed it. That's why we made that. Um, changes there. Um, certain tools, uh, as you notice, the quiz was one of the ones that had a lot of queries here. Um, certain tools allow us to set defaults like the quiz does, and those cascade down to future created quizzes. Others don't. Um, if we want to run some future queries, say for the assignment module or something similar that doesn't have the default settings kind of set, um, we can use these as kind of to provide recommendations to users but we can't do anything about it to set the defaults until that type of functionality is kind of added in. Um, some of the queries we plan to run in the future is maybe looking at question layout within a quiz, how many instructors are parting out um, questions, how many questions per part, um, late submissions, should we be allowing late submissions by default or not? Uh, is it the higher or the last score that's normally used for instructors? Um, and then things like navigation, linear, random as well. Maybe looking also at the number of tools that are published each semester, which ones get used the most. Um, and these can kind of allow us to further look at what we set in our templates. Um, so if you do have a system admin or you are the system admin, I would recommend running uh, queries similar to this, kind of get an idea of what your users are doing. And if you don't uh, know SQL, but you have access to the database, I heavily recommend LinkedIn Learning. It was kind of a quick little start um, to it, and I kind of got a good introduction to it. So Marty, you've got about a minute left. All right, so I'll jump into chat here. I'm gonna give the uh, image people though some photo credits and also throw up my um, contact information there as well. Uh, jumping back to the time limit one, people are at 250, 50. Um, Uh, Adam, that I actually have those rationales. They're just in my notes. Um, so I was hoping to just kind of say them out loud and that would be sufficient. But if you want, I can get you a 
kind of my notes version later on. Uh, Aurelio, no, um, but we do, we just have some third party vendors like Warpwire and Box. And so if someone does want to store a gigabyte file, if it's a video file, we would recommend Warpwire. Um, but if it's like a gigabyte uh, final cut file or something, post that in Box and then link to it is what we would probably recommend. Uh, PowerPoints, as David mentioned, those can get pretty big pretty quickly as well. Um, a lot of people, they start adding in voiceovers, images, video files as well. Um, so they don't really think about that. Storage on your computer itself is not usually a concern until you actually have to download it with a bad connection if you're on the other side as a student. Uh, I've heard of Echo 360. We used that at San Francisco State, and then we moved over to MediaSite actually as well. And um, so we don't have that anymore here at Duke. Uh, we don't have a specific, David, uh, policy to my knowledge about what to store um, where. There's probably some uh, ones that if, they, if the data includes like uh, confidential information, I do know there is certain stuff like that. But most of the uh, stuff that's probably in a course of like, here's my PowerPoint, here's my PDF, I would probably don't fall under those sort of uh, data restrictions. Uh, best practice kind of on that same scope, David. Um, I mean, that's really dependent on each class itself, I would say, uh, but I don't know of anyone where we say specifically, okay, art students store all your stuff in box, cinema students store your stuff elsewhere. Um, but it is usually best practice probably if it's a really large file of like 50 megabytes or more, I would probably say store in box. Uh, just because you get file versioning there as well, uh, versus storing in Sakai, um, you don't. Any other questions? Okay, I, have a, I believe I have saved the chat for you, Marty. And uh, okay. the, the program, the uh, conference will as well. So I'm going to, uh, you have any sum up statement, and then I'm going to stop the recording. I don't, so you can go ahead and pause it. Okay, and then I have 